Hello and welcome to this partnership uh, event organised by the British Napoleonic Bicentenary Trust in collaboration with Texas A&M University and the Oxford Research Centre in the Humanities. Over the next hour, we're going to be taken on a tour of St Helena, visiting the sites where Napoleon lived and died and the fortifications built and bolstered to keep him imprisoned. And we'll also look at the buildings which tell the lesser known story of the island's people at the time, including the history of slavery. Um, I'm your host for this evening. My name is Dr. Oliver Cox. I'm Heritage Engagement Fellow at the University of Oxford and co-lead of the Oxford University Heritage Network. Now, my team are, are busy creating and supporting uh, collaborative projects between our world-leading academic expertise in the University of Oxford and a wide range of partners in the UK and international heritage sector. We've been especially lucky to work with the British Napoleonic Bicentenary Trust over the past six months, um, really building up towards uh, the launch of the Bicentenary next May. So we've been very lucky to be part of this process and um, uh, we've been able to support internship uh, opportunities for our students and are really excited to be involved in future collaborations with this brilliant uh, organization. So our main speaker, tonight, and this is really my role, is to, is to introduce our main speaker, Professor Brent Fortenbury. And Brent is Assistant Professor of Arche uh, Arch Architecture and Associate Director for the Center of the Center for Historic uh, Heritage Conservation at Texas A&M University. Brent holds a PhD in Archaeology from Boston University, an MS in Historical Preservation from the Clemson uh, College of Charleston Graduate Program in Historic Preservation, and a BA in Anthropology from the College of William and Mary. Fulnbury specializes in the vernacular architecture of the British Greater Caribbean and has active field work in Bermuda, Barbados, Jamaica, Natchez, Mississippi, and coastal South Carolina. And we'll also hear tonight from James Bramble, Executive Director of the British Napoleonic Bicentenary Trust, who will update us on where the Napoleon 200 campaign has got to so far and, and lots of great activity since uh, the launch event a uh, little over a month ago. Now, without further ado, I'd Delighted to welcome Brent to the virtual stage, uh, broadcasting live from College Station in Texas. It's one of through the wonders of technology. And Brent is going to transport us uh, to the South Atlantic um, to experience um, in a very visceral way the built remains of, um, of, of St. Helena and explore ways in which we can share that heritage with as wide a range of people as possible. So Brent, over to you. Thanks very much, Oliver. Uh, excited to be here this evening uh, from Chile, Central Texas, um, and taking everyone on a virtual tour of the built heritage of St. Helena. I was lucky enough to travel to the island in January uh, of this year, uh, just prior to the outbreak of the pandemic. And over the course of a week on the island, I undertook um, a pretty comprehensive and systematic uh, documentation and conservation assessment of many of the critical built heritage sites on the island. And so the scope of the project really was to document the various components of the island's at-risk built heritage using digital technology, which I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, and then assess the architectural conditions of these sites. So, so why are they at risk? And what can we as stakeholders of the built uh, heritage um, do to ensure that they uh, are durable for future generations? Uh, moving forward, looking ahead, I'll be working with engineers and conservators and architects to develop conservation management plans for these sites and ultimately build local heritage capacity through future assessment and conservation workshops. So before I begin, let's just step back for a second and think about why, why is built heritage and why is heritage in general important? Um, really for me and for this project, there's sort of three main reasons why built heritage is important. First and foremost, it provides a tangible connection to the past. 
Uh, second, it provides a sense of individual, group, and community identity. And then finally, for a place like St. Helena uh, that relies very much on the tourism industry, it is a critical component of economic development. Um, as tourism begins to come back, um, not only environmental, but also built heritage tourism will be critical to the success and the survival of the St. Helena economy. So keep those ideas in mind um, as we march through the sites on our virtual tour today. Talking briefly about methods, uh, one of the areas in which heritage studies, archeology, span architectural history, and conservation have uh, begun to develop and use and leverage in their documentation schemes uh, is digital technology. And so all the sites that you'll see today, um, I documented by myself um, using a, a large volume laser scanner um, on the right-hand side of your screen and then a small drone. And that is really the advantage of using digital technology is that um, previously before the advent and widespread use of this technology, um, it would take a team of individuals to document sites like this weeks. Um, but with the advent of these intensely accurate um, with long range um, um, options, we can document heritage sites rapidly. Um, and so additionally, one of the advantages that we have is that we can then provide digital models of these sites for people to view. And it's one of the centerpieces of my lecture today is that we'll not only view static pictures of these amazing heritage sites, you'll also be able to engage with them through 3D models, which I'll talk about uh, in a second. So documentation is a major component of our project, of our assessment, uh, but also architectural conservation. Well, what does that mean? Essentially, architectural conservation is the assessment, the physical treatment, and the management of historic materials, whether they be individual building materials, whether they be standing buildings, whether they be uh, architectural and historic landscapes. And so ultimately, the goal of my part in this whole project is to ensure the durability of these heritage sites and their preservation for future generations, uh, as well as our current, uh, our current time as well. And so ultimately, in order to make these sites accessible, we need to come up with sustainable plans um, for their future. And that's very much um, a major goal of the charity moving forward is how can we build capacity and how can we make these resources durable for future generations. Tonight, our tour is in two acts. First, we'll talk about some of the fortifications that are contemporary with Napoleon's time on the island. Uh, we'll start off with the fortifications on Egg Island, uh, move to High Knoll Fort, uh, Banks's Battery, and then finally Jacob's Ladder. In Act 2, we'll talk about the domestic architecture on the island. So we'll briefly look at some of the uh, late 18th, early 19th century Georgian architecture in Jamestown. And then we'll look at Longwood House, uh, where Napoleon um, was held. And then finally, Toby's Cottage at the Briar will be used as a bridge to talk about the next um, lecture and seminar series, which focuses on the experiences of uh, enslaved individuals on St. Helena. Before we jump in, just a note here, um, you will have access to three digital models uh, that are on a open source platform called Sketchfab. And so um, for High Low Fort, for Banks Battery um, and Longwood, you'll be able to view these through the links that are provided through the chat uh, and comment window um, on your screen. In order to do that, simply navigate to the link and I'll show you on my screen as well uh, what those look like. So when you click on a link, you'll be taken to this open source platform called Sketchfab, and there you'll be able to engage with the 3D models and see many of the areas of interest. So many of these are annotated with these numbers. There's also a brief history of all these sites um, on the description of the Sketchfab platform. And so you can click on individual elements, zoom in, zoom out, and see many aspects of these sites through the digital models. And these digital models were generated through laser scan data, through drone photogrammetry, um, and you are able to engage with them as if you were there. Um, and that is one of the real hallmarks of digital documentation today. So um, you'll see those links. I will show them on the screen as well as I march through each of these individual sites. 
Uh, but I really invite you to explore these models as I'm talking about them. They give you a sense of scale um, and a deeper engagement with them um, as we look at the static pictures. This will be our base map for the, for the tour today. Um, I will refer to this each time um, for each one of the sites that we march through. And so this is um, a general Google Earth image of St. Helena, um, and each one of the sites as we move through them um, will be highlighted um, as a part of, um, as a part of each, each site visit. So let's begin with fortifications. As many of you know, um, fortifications are one of the character defining features of St. Helena's built environment. Uh, it is a fortified fortress island, just like um, many of the other British holdings in the Atlantic world, like Bermuda, like Barbados, like Jamaica. Uh, and fortifications really provide that sort of sense of place and really provide insight into the deeper thinking of the colonial project on St. Helena. As we march through each one of these sites, I'll be providing first sort of an overview of where each um, each fort is. I'll provide you with some historical um, images, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the history, and then jump into both the morphology of these sites, so what are their various elements, and then also talk about the conservation challenges at each one of these. And that's, again, one of the things to keep in mind as we march through each one of these sites, is that all, all of this work is an effort of conservation management. And so what can we do to rebuild stone walls, repoint uh, mortar? Uh, what various means can we take to ensure their durability for the future? So here we are. Uh, the first site that we're gonna visit is Cockburn's Battery on Egg Island. Uh, and we start here primarily because this is one uh, fortification installation that was specifically uh, constructed because of Napoleon's arrival on the island. And so here, if we're viewing our base map, um, Jamestown is just up um, in sort of the center uh, left of the screen. And you see in the lower left-hand corner, Egg Island that is highlighted um, in the red box. And here it is from a uh, satellite image as well. Uh, one of the, uh, the 1764 map, um, of the island shows Egg Island in the lower right-hand corner. You can see um, it's identified as I-E-G-G-E. -E. And Cockburn's battery, as I mentioned, uh, was constructed between uh, 1815 and artillery is placed at this fortification as early as 1819. And really, as you see from, uh, from the image of where it is, um, it's sitting just off the Southwest coast of the island. And so it was fortified so that it could not be used as a springboard for those um, uh, for those forces that were sympathetic to Napoleon to invade the island. Uh, unfortunately, not much of this installation survives today. Um, elements include a lower uh, firing platform, an upper bastion with associated barracks building, and a small wood, a small structure with a cobble floor, uh, perhaps a kitchen structure. Uh, an Eastern battery uh, is now lost on Egg Island, uh, but it's identified in archival sources uh, as having a wooden platform. Really, I first want to give you a sense of the landscape of Egg Island here, and you can see just how steep um, the slopes of this uh, island are that sit just off the uh, edge of St. Helena. And the image on the right sort of shows you the hiking um, and the climbing that we had to do in order to reach uh, the top um, of the area where the fortifications were. And here again, looking back toward the west coast of St. Helena, um, and again, this sort of profile view of the slopes um, of the island. It was an easily defensible position because um, of these steep slopes and uh, no trees um, and very craggy surface. And this is a panoramic image of what the fortification that survives looks like. And you can see, uh, a, a, a faint outline of a stone wall in the center of the screen. Here you see a close-up of the battery wall ruin uh, in the center of the screen, and you see the laser scanner uh, attempting to document this site. Uh, unfortunately, 
Um, as many of uh, you will know if you've visited uh, Egg Island, it's, it's known as Egg Island because of the migratory birds um, which nest there. And so during the entire time in which we tried to document this site, uh, hundreds of birds were flying around um, attacking us and our equipment, you can see here, um, because they nest um, on the island at various element, at various times during the year. And so because of its isolation, because of these birds, uh, not much of the built heritage survives and it's not very accessible. And so here you see the ruins um, of the main sort of battery wall, a dry laid stone volcanic uh, rock and not much material culture or much of the standing wall survive. Here again is another view um, of those standing walls that survive as well. And you can see the very sort of simple um, sort of impermanent nature of the fortifications here. Um, and again, because this was constructed very rapidly with Napoleon's arrival on the island um, in the first quarter of the 19th century. Only uh, one or only three pieces of ordnance survive on the island. And here you see them uh, in the lower firing platform, uh, which is um, on the western side of the island. And here you see them there as well. In terms of conservation management, not much survives um, of the island. And so um, not much survives of the built heritage of the island. And so we aren't gonna take substantial action to conserve it. Um, it's also incredibly inaccessible. Um, it is incredibly hard to get to. It's incredibly hard to hike up. Um, and so the best, the best approach for this is to, um, is to document it and then um, allow it um, to continue to exist uh, in place. And here you see uh, what remains of the shot oven um, on, on the island. Moving into the center of the island, High Knoll Fort is really the most substantial accessible fortification on St. Helena. And here you see again, uh, it's marked in the center, in the center of our map here in, in the red box. And so here you see a view of Jamestown in the upper right hand corner with High Knoll Fort near the bottom center of the image. And here's a close up from our Google satellite imagery um, of, of High Knoll Fort. It is one of the earlier forts that survives on the island. It dates to the 1790s and, it, and during the Napoleonic uh, period on the island, it was occupied by the 20th Regiment. Um, after Napoleon's death in 1821, forces withdrew from the fort, but it was later redeveloped in the 1860s. Um, essentially, and as we'll look at in the model and through the photographs, the northern portions of the fort likely date to the 1790s period, whereas the southern portions date to this redevelopment in the 1860s. The final portion um, of the um, of construction was completed in the late 1790s, and there's a keystone over the gate that actually dates um, to 1874 as well. And here you see um, a 1784 view of Jamestown with in the upper right hand corner on the cliffs, uh, you can see uh, just off in the distance, um, High Knoll Fort. And here is an 1821 rendering um, by James Watton um, of the fortification as well. And so now if you navigate to the, uh, if you navigate to the model on Sketchfab, you'll be able to see and engage with High Knoll Fort. And so as you navigate to it, you can see here, you can see this is the fortification. Each one of uh, those annotation numbers will allow you uh, to gain some more information. So here is the Northern Bass, uh, Northern uh, Keep and Firing Platform magazine, uh, with number four being the Southern a southern barracks and firing platform. And so please feel free to explore this model as we uh, look at some static images on the PowerPoint. So here you see High Knoll Fort uh, again from, this is, a, this is a laser scan image from the top. And again, on the left-hand side of the screen is north. Uh, you'll be able to see um, the, uh, the keep and the, and the um, original 1790s portion of the fort uh, with those later additions on the right-hand side as well. And this is a longitudinal view um, of it. 
and then followed by a view looking to the north and then a view looking uh, from the east as well. High Knoll Fort is one of the most accessible fortification sites um, on the island. And so it, it, it currently, uh, the interior is managed by the National Trust on the island and many local tours uh, visit it as well. Uh, with its open area, um, people are, are free to explore it and whatnot. Um, and so that's really why we're engaging with this, even though it was occupied uh, during a very short time during Napoleon's time on the island. Um, here you see a close up of that northern, of the northern elements, and you can see to the left of this picture um, the sort of cliff's edge that falls down into the Jamestown Valley um, of the fort. This is a drone image looking down again, and you can see uh, with the valley sort of falling away to either side just how much this fort commands the view of the central part of the island. And again, this is one of the only major uh, substantial interior forts um, on, on St. Helena. Here you see um, the later additions uh, from the later part of the 19th century to the south uh, with the barracks and the firing platform, um, and then looking to the north uh, from the exterior of the fort as well with the gun loops um, from that upper firing platform. And again, this is a view looking, uh, looking to the west. You can really see how it commands a view of the coastline. And here you see that keystone that dates to 1874 on the exterior of the main gate entrance into, um, into the building. One of the reasons why we engage with High Knoll Fort as well is because of the conservation challenges here. Um, two major events have happened in the last 15 years um, at this fort, and because it's the most accessible heritage site, we wanted to come up with um, an assessment that would identify those areas that need to be addressed um, as the conservation management of these built heritage sites continue. And so as you explore the model, uh, number, number one on your annotation, you'll be able to see uh, a major wall collapse, which occurred in the early 2000s um, at the site uh, after a storm. And so that is, as you see here in this image, that is the major threat to this piece of at-risk heritage, is that that portion of wall has, has collapsed. And eventually, if it's not addressed, um, further elements of the firing platform and the western wall will, uh, will continue to degrade. And here you can see a close-up uh, of that wall um, that is further degrading um, as management of that built fabric is not undertaken. And here you see uh, two more images um, of the collapsed wall uh, as well. Repointing the mortar is also a major issue, which you see here. Um, local artisans were trained to, um, to uh, make appropriate mortars. Um, and that really needs to be undertaken throughout the entirety of this site. You can see the various elements of Portland cement, uh, mortars that don't exist in certain places, uh, dry light areas need to be cleaned of biogrowth. All those things uh, need to be addressed as the management of this site um, needs to continue to take place um, moving forward. Erosion is also a major issue that um, needs to be addressed on the site as well as fill from the inside of the fort is continually falling away. And so those are, those are some of the various elements of this monumental piece of fortification um, on St. Helena that was occupied during Napoleon's time on the island. Um, and we hope um, as a working group to address many of those conservation challenges moving forward. So now moving to the Northwest corner of the island, uh, a series of fortifications called Banks Battery. Um, here on our fort, you can, uh, here on our map, you can see um, in the upper central part of, of the map is Banks Battery. And really it sits at, um, the, it sits at the mouth of a valley um, on the western coast of the island. And so the idea was that it would be fortified um, so that any potential invasion um, of the island, not just during Napoleon's time, but any time during the uh, British occupation of the island could be thwarted. And so here you see an aerial image um, of the installation um, from Google. And uh, this is just looking from the south to the north. And here, if you look on again on that 1790s map, you can see in the lower uh, left-hand corner of the island, uh, it's labeled as Port Valley, um, meaning Port Valley um, on, this, 
on this French map. And here, if you look to the far left of this image, you can see um, you can see the fortifications at Banks, just barely off in the distance. Banks Battery is one of the earliest surviving elements of fortification on the island, uh, dating to as early as 1678. Um, and it appears on the seller's map in 1682. Uh, again, I mentioned it was a strategic location because of where it was. Uh, it was on one of the navigable harbors and valleys um, on the northwestern side of the island. And really throughout the 17th and 18th century, the curtain wall on the lower section comprised four to eight guns, uh, seven during the Napoleonic period. There's also a section that I call Upper Banks, which is a half moon battery. Um, it was constructed about six years later um, than the lower fortification. So uh, in, the, in the 1680s and 1690s. And archival accounts maintain that in 1777, there were six guns positioned um, on this upper battery. The fortification really um, fell into disrepair by the middle of the 19th century. And so, again, if you if you navigate to uh, your Sketchfab link here, you'll be able to see you'll be able to see Upper Banks Battery. So, if you click on Upper Banks again here, you can see and explore uh, this uh, this fortification as I talk about it. The Half Moon Battery at Upper Banks here you see from an aerial image uh, from the drone model. Um, you can see where it gets its name from, that Half Moon. And unfortunately, because of the isolation of this site, it has really fallen into disrepair. It's incredibly hard um, to get uh, resources up here to manage, uh, to manage this site. And so here you see a profile looking. Um, this is not a photograph. This is the digital model uh, looking from the west to the east um, on, um, on this fortification. And you can see some of the areas that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, the wall collapses um, that threaten the integrity of the Half Moon Battery. And here you see another profile image uh, looking, from, uh, looking from the north to the south. You'll see on the annotation, there are several ruined buildings that are noted. I'll, I'll note sort of um, on your on your Sketchfab model, number four is the magazine, and that's that door a doorway that uh, appears in the middle uh, upper middle right um, of the screen on this static image of the digital model. And one of the challenges, as I said, with this fortification is that many of the walls are collapsing, and so we need to go in at some point and reconstruct these walls. Otherwise, the entire Half Moon installation is really at risk. Um, from from uh, failure. Many of the ruined buildings, which you'll note as um, number seven, eight, and nine um, on, on the 3D model are really just foundations and nothing really survives um, on the interior um, of those buildings as we visited the site. And then this is again, just another longitudinal section um, of, the, of the fort as well. Here you see many um, of the, uh, the nature of the ruined structures that survive at Upper Banks. Um, you can see that there have been some mortar repairs, but really nothing survives um, of the buildings beyond these foundations. And really our goal moving forward is to be able to interpret, but not necessarily uh, undertake major conservation efforts um, at these isolated buildings. Here again, you see another uh, ruined support structure um, at this uh, installation. And here you see where they've attempted to repair the wall uh, with some inappropriate mortar sometime, probably in the 1990s, and we'll need to go in and apply appropriate mortars to ensure the stability of that wall moving forward. And just more of the ruined buildings um, of the Half Moon Battery. Lower Banks, which sits um, at the lower portion um, to the south of of the Half Moon Battery is an, in, an incredibly striking piece of fortification that unfortunately is falling into the sea. Again, if you navigate to your Sketchfab link here, you can see Lower Banks' battery here um, with various annotations about um, the support structures 
um, and surviving curtain wall at this site. And really, in, in terms of the character defining features of the island, uh, this fortification really uh, stands out for its late 17th, early 18th century design with these crenellations and these firing positions. And then this arched, arched tunnel that served as a culvert uh, draining um, system as a part um, as a part of the fortification. And so this image taken from the rocks to the north of Banks really gives you that sense of place. It gives you that sense of how this fortification was to defend the valley um, as, as ships approach from the north and the west. And you can see the fortification there um, on the left side of the screen. And again, here's uh, some static images of, of the photogrammetric model, which you have access to on Sketchfab. Um, and here you can see the state of repair of, of the fortification um, that is pulling away from the shoreline because of erosion and because of um, wave action. And really, um, efforts to stabilize and maintain the curtain wall and the arch um, are our main focus uh, if work is undertaken at this site. And here you see again, this is not a photograph, this is a 3D model. Um, and then this is, the, this is the fortification as it sits today. And you can see just how close it is to the water. And everything to the right, if you see that, uh, that irregular shoreline uh, with that uh, wall, all of that is where a wall has been lost to the sea. And so all that remains of the curtain wall is in the left third of the photograph. And so efforts need to be made to stabilize and document um, the curtain wall, the crenellations, um, and the arched opening here. Because again, in terms of what survives on the island, almost nothing survives uh, in, this, in this level of integrity uh, from, from the late 17th and early 18th century. And there you can actually see us there in the middle uh, right of the photograph, uh, me flying the drone um, with my guide um, sitting next to me, just to give you a sense of scale of this fortification. And here you can see in profile, just as the curtain wall is pulling away and falling back um, from the shoreline. And so efforts really need to be made um, to ensure the long-term durability of this piece of St. Helena's fortification. And again, just some more images for you to give you a sense of place um, of Banks's battery. And here you see another image of that collapsing wall on the northern extent um, of the fortification as well. And here you see inside of that archway opening, you can see the way that the barrel vault is sort of pulling, pulling away in a twisting action because of the way that the curtain wall is falling away um, from the shoreline. And so an engineer will need to go in here and shore this up. Um, otherwise it'll collapse in the very, uh, very near future. And here's another image of that separating joint uh, in that arched barrel vault. Before we move into the domestic architecture, we'll talk very briefly about Jacob's Ladder, which if you've been to St. Helena, I hope that you have climbed it. Um, I, I attempted to climb it. Um, I made it all the way to the top, but uh, that was my cardio for the next two weeks. It was incredibly difficult. Um, and here you can really see um, the valley in and around Jamestown. And if you look in the middle right, if you can see my cursor, uh, the, the steps that survive that go from Jamestown to Ladder Fort above. And so really Jacob's Ladder as it known today is uh, what survives of a horse-driven cable railway installed in 1829. And it was designed to carry material from Jamestown to Ladder Fort um, above. It was designed by um, a local engineer, J.W. Hoare, and cars would run on a pair of iron rails that were fixed on wooden joists, which you'll see um, in a second on, um, a, on a historical magazine photograph. And so it rises 603 feet, um, at, and it's 924 feet in length, 699 steps, uh, with an average rise of 11 inches. Um, they have a race up it every year, um, which um, I will never be participating in, uh, but I strongly encourage you to do so um, if you can. Um, in 1871, the railway was dismantled and now only the stairs remain. And so here is a late 19th century view of Jacob's Ladder um, from a magazine article. And then here uh, from 1834, on the left, you can see the way that 
the mechanism worked. And so on the left and right, you see barrels, hogshead in these carts that are pulled up and down on rails uh, with steps in the middle. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, the mechanism uh, in which the livestock um, pulled pulled those ropes to pull the carts up and down. And this is what it looks like today. So only that center stairway survived in the left-hand image, those center stairs, all that is what survives today. Um, there have been several iterations of repairs, um, sometimes with Portland cement um, to this. And so really part of our efforts are gonna be to stabilize and replace uh, lost cast iron, um, as well as replace some of the failing stairs as a part of um, as a part of our conservation work moving forward. To give you a sense of the incline and the and the scale of this, here are several photogrammetric images uh, that that I took through over a thousand drone images, and it gives you sort of that sense of incline, particularly here um, going up uh, Jacob's ladder. It really is. It's a Grade One listed. Uh, heritage site uh, within um, within St. Helena. And so its durability is incredibly important um, for the wider um, heritage landscape um, of the island. And here you see just some close-up images. You can see uh, where those rails were on either side of the steps that survive. Only the only the inner rails of that rail uh, railway survive today. And you can see where it was dismantled on either side. Here's just some more images. Um, of it as well. And you can see um, maintenance work, generalized maintenance through a management plan, uh, as well as general cleaning and assessment um, will be critical to ensuring uh, the, the, not just the survival of the um, grade one listing monument, but also uh, just for the safety, because this is something that people um, use every day to walk from Ladder Hill uh, down to Jamestown and then back up. Um, up the hill as well. So um, it's it's not just a heritage site, it's a, it's a pedestrian thoroughfare on St. Helena as well. So shifting from fortifications, let's talk in our last 10 minutes here uh, about domestic architecture. And so while fortifications are this major character defining feature of St. Helena, the domestic architecture is as important for us to understand everyday life on St. Helena. And so Jamestown, which you see here, um, in, um, in the red box. Jamestown boasts an amazing set of late 18th, early 19th century Georgian architecture that you would see throughout the British Atlantic world during this time. Uh, here you see uh, a side passage, uh, five bay Georgian, a Georgian building with uh, coins on either end and sash windows and dormers uh, really using uh, using the architectural language of the Georgian period here on, even on isolated St. Helena. Um, and these buildings really need to be documented uh, just as much as uh, the fortifications are because they are another component of the built heritage um, environment. Here you see another side passage, hipped roof, um, five bay wide Georgian dwelling. And you see here, um, that's common throughout the British Atlantic, um, where you have uh, a raised first floor living area and then the door on the right uh, where uh, the man is standing, that's access to the cellar below uh, where there would be storage uh, of goods within the mercantile economy. Um, and so uh, these buildings, which I wasn't able to document, uh, people live in them, uh, obviously, um, documenting these are as important as documenting uh, the fortifications. And here you see uh, some of the military associated uh, storehouse buildings uh, in, in Jamestown as well. So talking about um, a couple domestic sites, the one you've probably been waiting for me to talk about, uh, Longwood House, uh, the uh, residence of Napoleon while on St. Helena. Um, here you see it's near the very center of the island. Um, and it was originally a farm estate belonging to the East Indian Company in 1743 and it served as uh, uh, the residence of Napoleon from 1815, uh, really due to its elevated interior position, it's free of woodland. It's, uh, it's on this sort of hill that doesn't have any trees uh, on it. Here you see Longwood House in 1815, and then you see this 1821 map of not just Longwood, but the gardens as well. And so if you ever get a chance to visit uh, the house, uh, it's, it's not just the, the core house where 
Napoleon um, lived, but also the gardens and then what are often referred to as uh, the general's quarters behind as well, which um, were comprised not only support spaces, but also where his uh, fellow confined um, generals lived uh, as well. And here you see um, the whole complex in plan from uh, late 19th century floor plan. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, the billiard room and the salon. Um, really, it's, it's this T-shaped core, if you can see my uh, cursor, that, um, that is what was uh, documented very briefly. I only had about an hour and a half um, here as a, as a part of our work. Um, and there are plenty of photographs on the interior um, in which you can see the, uh, the finishes and the furnishings um, of Longwood. And here you see that plan again um, from a, from a um, mid uh, 19th century um, rendering. And again, a later 19th century rendering of Longwood as well. And so again, I invite you to navigate to the, um, I invite you to navigate to the 3D model which you can see on, on the link of Longwood House. And you can really get the sense of the components of, of the building. And so here you see it's this T-shaped plan. The original, the original component is, if you zoom in, you, you can see where those, um, where the rustication, the coins on the end stop. This sort of short T-shaped building is the core of the building. And then the billiard room here on the left was added on um, in the early 1815s as a part of the redevelopment of the site. And so you can explore the gardens that are directly adjacent uh, to the building, but also uh, the architecture as well. Longwood is probably, um, and by probably I mean is, um, the most visited um, historic house uh, on the island because of its association with Napoleon. Ironically, it, it, it's not really a remarkable piece of architecture. Um, it is it is very much, it gains its uh, value from the fact that Napoleon um, was in residence on the site. And so here um, you can see, again, this aerial image from the, uh, from the 3D model of this T-shaped, uh, T-shaped core. And then you can see again, this is a reproduction of what you see on the model um, of, of the gardens and the grounds of the main house with the support buildings uh, to the rear. One of the major challenges at Longwood, like any building that's in a tropical environment, that's in a coastal marine environment is rising damp. And so one of our efforts will be to uh, work with local artisans to develop appropriate lime mortars and lime washes uh, to ensure that the integrity of, of the interior and exterior walls uh, remain intact. Uh, there's nothing you can do about rising damp. There's nothing you can do about salt in the air, but you can use historically appropriate materials uh, to finish the interior uh, of the walls. And here you see more evidence of rising damp where the uh, stucco is pulling away uh, from, from the wall. Finally, we end here at Toby's Cottage, and Toby's Cottage is 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 a bridge to our next discussion um, in the next um, in the next seminar um, in a few weeks time and Toby's Cottage is incredibly important because it tells the story uh, it tells the story of, in, of enslaved individuals enslaved lifeways on St. Helena um, unlike the fortifications and unlike the monumental architecture that we've seen so far, Toby's Cottage is incredibly important to tell uh, the story of captive uh, individuals on St. Helena. And so here it is on, um, on the map here, you see near the center, it is roughly to the uh, south and east of Jamestown along, along that valley that runs to the Hardship Waterfall. It really is, um, it's called Toby's Cottage, we'll talk about it in a second, but it really is a kitchen quarter. It's an outbuilding, it's a support building for the Briars Estate. Um, the estate was established as early as 1678 and sold to the East India Company in 1739. And William Balcom took over the property in 1811 and established a brewery there. Napoleon lived here from the 18th of October to the 10th of December, 1815, while Longwood House was being prepared. And so Toby's Cottage for my sort of week on the island is one of the few surviving elements of the built environment associated with 
um, enslaved individuals on St. Helena. While Balcom owned the property, we know that he had 21 enslaved persons, um, 10 women and 11 men, and one of those was Toby. And so we know from historical accounts that Napoleon and Toby had many interactions, and that's something that's going to be talked about um, in, in our next seminar. But really, Toby's Cottage is a placeholder for the broader experience of enslaved individuals, uh, domestic enslaved individuals on St. Helena. And one of the things that sets it apart on St. Helena relative to places like Jamaica or Barbados is that there really wasn't a plantation economy. Uh, slavery was focused on uh, domestic service on St. Helena. And so Toby's Cottage is one surviving architectural um, element of that landscape of which little survives today. So here is the front of the Briars, um, which has been redeveloped several times uh, after Napoleon departed. Um, and then here you see an 1847 image um, of the site as well. Uh, the cottage is not uh, visible uh, in this image. And so this is a drone image on the left hand side. Uh, you can see uh, the Briars main complex and over to the right near where the garden fields are is where Toby's Cottage is um, today. And here you see uh, a drone image looking directly down on this three room complex of which you can probably easily see just two rooms here. And here you see in oblique drone imagery um, what's left. All that's left are the standing walls, um, sort of up to up to five to six feet height. Uh, no roof survives. It might not look like much, but it's incredibly, it's an incredible, incredibly important piece of the domestic architecture of St. Helena. And so here again, you see, we have much work to be done on this site to clean it up and reinterpret it um, as an element of of the built environment on St. Helena. And here you just sort of see the overgrown nature of the site. And really this will be uh, moving forward, hopefully this will be the centerpiece of interpreting those subaltern lifeways um, on St. Helena um, for visitors to the site. And you can just see the state of repair, dry laid stone wall um, that then, then just has this yellow ochre lime wash that's applied to the exterior um, of the walls to to keep those stones uh, intact. And here you see a reconstructed plan. And then what uh, my students and I have done is we have reconstructed what Toby's Cottage would have looked like based on surviving architectural elements here. So you see a section with a sort of very simple common raptor roof. Um, the elements here, you can see what survives. Um, and then we've put a gable roof on it uh, with this attached kitchen building um, on the end. And this is something that we're gonna talk about uh, extensively um, in the next seminar on, on enslavement on St. Helena. So there's much more to look at. Uh, there's much more to document, much more to assess on St. Helena. This was just sort of a, a brief sort of whirlwind tour over the last uh, 40 minutes to introduce you to some of the most important heritage sites. Buttermilk Battery, which is further to the north. Um, uh, Banks Battery is a fantastic fortification that's built into the side um, of the cliffs. Lemon Valley, another valley fortification, um, is another area which hopefully we'll investigate in the future. So um, hopefully this gives you a really good idea of the breadth and diversity of heritage sites on St. Helena. And moving forward, what we hope to do through this program is we hope to engage in stakeholders on the island, heritage stakeholders on the island, to build heritage capacity through an on-site on workshop. So provide training to identify at-risk buildings, at-risk heritage sites, uh, do bricks and mortar conservation training to use appropriate materials, do physical conservation work, and then ultimately also build a heritage trail in digital interpretation uh, to allow us to both uh, from afar, from wherever we are, but also on the island, experience the built environment through a trail. So I thank you very much for your attention over the last 40 minutes. Um, look forward to your questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brent, for a, a fabulous tour of the of the remarkable um, heritage, built heritage of, of St Helena and, and touching upon so many rich narratives that can be drawn out over uh, coming and, and future collaborations. I'm going to take Chair's per, uh, prerogative and just ask you one question, if I may, Brent, which is what do you see as the, the greatest technological challenge 
facing um, facing experts such as yourself in in terms of conserving and and um, Saint Helena's heritage. Yeah, that is really the the biggest challenge for Saint Helena. Like so many um, islands in the Atlantic world, is its isolation, and so to import uh, appropriate materials, appropriate expertise, appropriate training. Um, is incredibly difficult. Um, you know, fr from the United States, it takes the better part of two days to get there um, with several plane rides. Um, importing materials from, uh, from South Africa or Britain um, is, is incredibly difficult and costly. But what's, what's important is that these pieces of the, of the built heritage, just because they're isolated, just because they're not accessible, doesn't mean they're not important. It doesn't mean that they don't have value within the broader scheme of understanding the early modern period and how it can tell us more about the 21st century. And so really through the charities work, we are going to be able to connect those resources and that expertise from around the world to those stakeholders on St. Helena. That's right. It sounds an absolutely fantastic project. And I think in doing so, it leans into this kind of imperial amnesia that I think has characterized Britain's heritage sector for for decades, really, this idea that we, we, you know, there's been a conscious forgetting of the imperial project, and I think what you've done in in your tour today is is demonstrate the the extent to which there has been there is a material investment in empire in terms of those remarkable fortifications, and I was particularly struck, Brent, how you how you drew a link across the Atlantic to to both Bermuda, Barbados, and and similar fortifications in the Caribbean, and it, it just struck me that it really is a sort of this is sort of a, a globe. A, this is the architecture of globalization, really. In but in the 18th century as well as the 21st century, I'm going to hand over to the um, executive director of the uh, British Napoleonic Bicentenary Trust now, James Bramble, just to give us a few updates on on where the Napoleon 200 uh, celebrations are at this present moment in time. James, over to you. Thanks, Ollie, and thanks, Brent, for that superb presentation. Um, I hope everyone has found it as fascinating as, as I have. Um, I know everyone will have lots of questions, so I won't interrupt uh, for, for too long. Um, Brent has introduced many of the sites that the Trust, through the Napoleon 200 campaign, wants to preserve, uh, to protect them from further deterioration. And you would have seen tonight that the state of many of those sites is quite poor. Uh, and the work is urgent. Um, our priority is Toby's Cottage, um, which Brent took us to at the end of his presentation. Um, Toby's Cottage, as Brent explained, will tell the story not only of Toby, uh, who was a enslaved person on the island who Napoleon interacted with, and that's well documented, um, but also the story of slavery on the island more generally. Uh, and hence is a very important project. So that is our, our priority. Um, we don't have time to do that story justice tonight. Uh, we wanted to introduce you to the built heritage and the condition of the buildings. Um, but our next event on the 25th of November will, de will be dedicated to that, uh, to slavery on the island and the Toby's Cottage project. So please do put that in your diary now. 6 p.m. UK time on the 25th of November, um, and we'll be sending out details on how to join that soon. Um, if you're not on our mailing list, then you will not receive that invitation. So please do join our mailing list uh, by going to the website at napoleon200.org, uh, where you can also learn some more about our work and where we have got to with the bicentenary. Um, in addition to Toby's Cottage, the fortifications that Brent talked about, uh, Banks' Battery and Munden's Battery, are also on our list of sites to be preserved if funding allows. Um, we need to raise about £100,000 to preserve and interpret Toby's Cottage, 50000 for Munden's Battery and 250000 uh, for Banks. Um, so we do have a relatively steep funding target. These are clearly difficult times, but Toby's Cottage is our immediate priority and then we will fundraise for the others as we can uh, and as the bicentenary evolves um, over the coming months and years. If you've been moved by the condition of any of those sites, 
um, and you want to play a part in safeguarding any of these fascinating buildings for future generations, please do consider either making a donation via the website uh, or by emailing me di directly at james at napoleon200.org, james at napoleon200.org. Equally, if you know of others who you feel could support our work, please do pass my details, the details of the website, etc., to them. I'd be uh, delighted to speak to anyone who is interested in supporting us. Um, in addition to the event on the 25th of November, there are further online events planned with there are some really fascinating subjects and some really exciting speakers lined up. Um, we'll be exciting, uh, we'll be announcing those soon. Um, again, via the mailing list, which is why it's important that you register for that. Um, and we will have a number of very exciting announcements coming up over the next month. Uh, but I will say no more about that now. Um, so let me just say, finally, thank you for joining this event, uh, for your interest in our work. Uh, and I invite you all please to get involved in whichever way you can. Uh, and on that note, I will hand back to you, Ollie. Thanks very much, James. And, and there have been a few questions coming in there thick and fast uh, via our live stream on YouTube. So thank you ever so much to those who have contributed. I'm going to ask a question uh, from Peregrine Bryant uh, for you, Brent. And he asks, is there a local source of lime for mortars on the island or did they use seashells as a source? So, so uh, thanks, Peregrine. Uh, I actually know him, so um, <laughs> thanks for the question. Um, so, so from from what we know is that they were burning uh, oysters, but they were also importing lime from uh, from the west coast of Africa and burning them, um, and importing uh, lime a limestone as blocks as a part of battlestone ships. And, and so one thing that I actually didn't mention, which I'll show very quickly, is that at Banks Battery, there is a lime kiln that survives on the island. So let me just show that uh, very briefly here. And you can explore that um, as well, if you all can see my screen. There's a great lime kiln that survives um, stone on the exterior and brick on the interior, um, where they burned lime as a part of construction. Um, on the island and for mortar in particular. So, so much like many places uh, throughout the British Atlantic, they're bringing in the materials to burn. Um, one of the things you have to remember is that, um, and again, I, I'm not an environmental scientist, but because we're in the middle of the ocean, uh, the ability to collect oyster shell to burn is incredibly limited. And so they would need to bring that limestone in to burn um, as a part of ballasts um, on ships. Wonderful. Thanks ever so much, Brent. And we have another question uh, uh, that's come in from Amanda Westcott, who asks, to what extent do historical drawings or photographs inform these digital renderings? And um, will those uh, historical sources play a part in future digital interpretation? Absolutely. So, so one of the one of the great things about St. Hel uh, one of the great things about the island is that there are piles of historical renderings of many of the built heritage sites on the island. And so what we can do, much like we did with Toby's Cottage, is that we can look to those as a reference for reconstruction, uh, particularly Banks Battery, High Mill Fort. We have historical images, uh, renderings from the 19th and early 20th century that will inform our conservation and preservation designs and reconstruction on those. And, and that's a, it's, it's a great opportunity to leverage those resources, uh, again, for a place like St. Helena that is seemingly isolated. The archival evidence, the, particularly the graphic visual representation of the island is in great abundance relative to a lot of other places. And so we can use those as we go about appropriate conservation maintenance on these sites. Thanks, Brent. And I, I wondered if I could steal uh, Chair's prerogative and ask one final question, which expands upon your point about archives. And I was, I was just intrigued as to, you know, where are the major archival concentrations in terms of in terms of documents, in terms of resources for this work? And, and how do you as, a, as a, a leading scholar in this field draw together all of those disparate sources of information? I think it'd be fascinating to hear about both the historical, but your, your process as a, as a, in terms of researching and where you need to go in order to find those raw materials. Absolutely. So, so, so because of my background um, in conservation 
and architectural history, I really start with the buildings first. And so this is this is the first foray um, into understanding what survives of the material elements um, of built heritage sites. But many of the archives that are associated with St. Helena are in London, um, in the in the records office um, in various places in London. And so, and so the next step as we continue to research these sites will be to travel to London once once COVID uh, passes. Um, but at the same time, you know, in the 21st century, the, our ability to uh, use online portals to download information right now. If if you're a historical scholar and, and you can't get to London and you need to access a lot of this material, um, the National Archives allows you to download them. Um, you don't even need to visit them now. Um, and in a time of COVID, as a um, as I have experienced, they make uh, 30 free downloads a week available for free. Um, so if you need to do some archival research, now's the time to do it uh, in the time of COVID. Really, it is um, it is that process to to look at the built heritage site and then go to the archive and use those together um, as as a part of the process of interpretation. I will say just sort of uh, one thing as we're running out of time, um, St. Helena might seem isolated, but uh, it just shows you how pervasive the idea of it is. I was at a I was at a plantation on the River Road near New Orleans a week ago, and it is a French style uh, uh, landscape garden, reconstructed garden called Petit Versailles. And in the middle of Petit Versailles, there is a fort that is modeled after Banks Battery called St. Helena Fort in the middle of this 19th century French garden. And so the designer of that landscape had been to St. Helena, uh, had read about it. And so they decided in a, in a small corner of, uh, you know, less than a mile from the Mississippi River in the 19th century to reconstruct uh, Banks Battery, the lower platform with the arches and the crenellations and all. And so it really is a testament to the connected nature of the British Atlantic world and the idea um, of the built environment in the 19th and 20th century. And so um, we take for granted the, uh, how we can be connected all over the world right now. But even in the 19th century, St. Helena was very much in the minds of many people moving throughout the British Atlantic world. It's an incredibly fascinating and important place to understand this early modern period. Thanks, Brent. I think you couldn't have summed it up, couldn't have summed it up better. This is a project with truly global reach and and uh, and truly global impact. Um, so that's it from Brent and I. We're going to hand back to uh, James Bramble from Napoleon 200 um, for a final couple of words. But thank you ever so much for, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again on the 25th of November at 6 p.m. Thank you, Ollie, and thank you, Brent. So yes, let me just reiterate uh, Ollie's thanks, reiterate that date. 25th of November, 6 p.m. UK. Um, join the mailing list to receive details. Um, it will be a fascinating event, and I hope that you will all join us then. So thank you very much. <laughs>